message in this series called The Call of God. How many realize that as a Christian you are called into the ministry? Let me see your hands here today. If you didn't understand that, that is an important part of your walk with God. Like anything with God, call, of course, uh, is a verb, and we need to do active things to, to participate in the call of God. You can't just sit there. You can't just expect it to happen. A lot of people think that God is just going to do it for you. If you've come to the place or you're of the place of understanding that God is going to or can or will, guess what? He never will. You always have to walk in present tense with God. God is very upset in a sense of not you understanding how he works. He is always now. He has created time for us. There is no such thing as time for God. There is no such thing. He's eternal. There is no time with God. He's ever-present. So when you speak to God, you can't speak him in future tense. You can't speak to him in past tense. You must speak to him in present tense. I am healed. I am blessed. That doesn't mean the physical manifestation of it might be there. Because whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have. So you, I believe that I am healed. I believe that I am called. I believe I'm prosperous. Then you start walking it out. Are you all here with me here today? You're supposed to walk it out. And I used to picture this as, a, as standing in front of an old-time projector. How many know what I'm talking about? As though these lights were like that. And we don't have that kind of anymore because everything's so digitized. But even here, the projection of a screen. And before you is the word of God, and you know that you believe you receive, so you walk by faith into it. Bring it in. And so today I want to do that very thing in the spirit realm concerning your call, because it's so important that you understand this. Just to sit there and wait for God to do something is going to wait until hell freezes over. Now that might offend some of your religious minds, but... What are you doing? Look at your life. Are you still waiting? Are you still wondering? How many know that you're, fa that you're saved right now? Let me see. Are you sure? How do you know? How do you know? Because the Word of God told you so. Now, you might not feel saved sometimes, but that doesn't e ne negate the fact that you are. I don't feel like getting up sometimes. But that does not negate the fact that I have to get up. I don't like to be in church sometimes. I'm just like you. I love church, but there's sometimes I don't want to be in church. I like, not, or I like to be in church all the time. But that, a long time ago, I didn't like that. Not anymore. Hallelujah. Amen. I like to be in church. And so you've got to walk by. Are you all here with me here today? Just walk into this. Walk, in, walk into your call. Yeah, some, guess what? Look to your neighbor. Right now, come on, and in a nice way, come on, look to your neighbor, and in a nice way, smile and say, you're getting older. That's a fact. Did you know that's a fact? And another year is ready to pass. 2014 is, is three, two-thirds over. When are we going to do what we're supposed to be doing? We're waiting on God. Well, let me just say, let me reverse that. God is waiting on you. The children of Israel could have, this is not even the message, okay? The children of Israel could have gotten into the promised land within 12 to 21 days. But it took them 40 years because of unbelief. Unbelief is evil. You know what unbelief is? It's a compound word in the Greek meaning no faith. Faith is active. Faith is a verb. Therefore, it can be added and said because they didn't act on what God told them. And when you don't act on what God tells you, that is evil. An evil heart of unbelief, the Bible in, in Hebrew says. They sit there expecting something to happen. Oh, it's going to happen. No, God's not going to do anything. He already has done everything. 
All the promises of God in him are what? Yes and what? Amen unto the glory of God. Hallelujah. So today I want to preach a message that I hope will rock your world. I hope that you get mad enough and glad enough to do something about it. Hallelujah. I'm expecting smiles to resurrect on those frowning faces and come into expectancy because God is greater than your problem. God is greater than your situation. God is about to do miracles in your life right now. Not gonna, not shall be, not will be. God is in the midst of us right now. And he's saying unto you, if you want it, here it is. Come and get it. How many remember that song? Hallelujah. All the older people said amen. And all you younger ears dismissed it. Hallelujah. So, Father God, we thank you again for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Know you better. The eyes of our understanding are enlightened. We know the hope of what we're called. And, Father, only good things come our way. Whatever we put our hands to prospers. And, Lord God, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We are more than conquerors through Christ. And, Lord, Father, neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come shall separate us from the love of God. And, Father, we walk by the word. We walk by faith. Lord, Father, not just word memorized, but, Lord, word lived out in faith, Lord, Father, right now. And we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. And all the redeemed said, hallelujah. We're talking about your calling your, the church and putting it all together. This is the third part. And what we're going to discuss today is how the church should look when we function like the Bible says we're supposed to function. I, I, I'm sad to say we are so far from the New Testament that it's, it's striking. But we're getting there by faith in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In the past two messages, we discussed some of the processes in which you, you as an individual are to discover your calling, your gifting, and your place in the body. In Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul, how many are excited that someday they're going to meet Apostle Paul in heaven? Won't that be awesome? Hey, Paul, what's up? High five. In heaven. Hallelujah. And he said this in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, talking about this very idea that we're looking at. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to the apostle, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel toward the Gentiles. This is a practical fact that you need to understand. There is a general, special, and specific calling that each of you and I, us together, need to work out. It is so important that you understand this. Our job, listen to this, is to discover. There's a discovery. You know, we need to understand if it, the only thing that's out there, the only way we can get it is by two ways. Somebody telling us or we by the Holy Spirit discover it. And both ways are by the Holy Spirit. We are to discover we are to then develop and we are to put into practice our calling, our gifting individually so that we together, everybody say the word together, say it like you mean it, together can put and partner with God in building his kingdom. We are in the last days if you have not recognized it. And we need to be part and participant with God in partnership to expand the kingdom. This, this is not a day for just us. This is a day for all of us to go forth and reach the world. If you have not looked around, look at how safe we are in our beautiful country. But the world is in turmoil. The United States is in turmoil. Gastonia has turmoil, it's situations that are, are beyond our reach that we need to take to them. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, how do you go about discovering your calling? We'll just kind of do a review, and let me just break it down for you so you can understand. Once you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you become part of the ministry of the body of Christ. How many, see, how many, how many are believers here today? Let me see your hands. Say, I am a member, a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am an active member and minister in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will go forth every day as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't care who you are, what intellectual level you are in the things of God. Sometimes the less you know, the better off you are because the more you know, the more you sit back and do nothing. But the more you know about what to do, then you can do it more effectively. Hallelujah. 
So first of all, what we need to understand, in this ministry calling, you work out what I, what I call the general call. This is the Christian practices that you are to continually do on a daily basis, all the stuff that the Bible says that you were supposed to do. I'm to pray. I'm to read the Word. I'm to give. I'm to come to church. I'm to get involved. I'm supposed to be a witness. I'm supposed to love God with all my heart. I'm supposed to do all those things and anything else the Word of God tells us. That is part of your general call. That is part of what you do. This is what I am. This is what I do. This is what God wants us to love. It's not to be saved. You're already saved if you know Jesus. These are characteristic of a person who knows Jesus. You should want to come to church if you're saved. You should want to read the Bible if you're saved. You should want to witness. You should want to give because you have a love in your heart that has been shed abroad by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. So that's the stuff you do. Now listen to this. As you minister and do the stuff. I love that. As a theological term that is beyond under just a little random thing. The stuff is all inclusive. That's everything. Everything you put your hand to. You get involved in the ministry of helps. Whatever is available, just put your hand to it. As you do the stuff, God will then and only then. Some of you who are sitting back waiting. God will only then as you do the stuff. Get involved. Well, some of you are checking out the church, checking out the ministries, and you're still waiting for God to show you something. You know, it's up to you. Can I get excited here a little bit? Hallelujah. It's up to you. You can wait and wait and wait and wait, but it's up to you until you go forth and start to get involved in what God has put in place. Well, I don't know if I like that. Well, that's tough. You will like it. Because God will then begin to reveal his giftings, his callings to you. This is called your special calling. He'll begin to lay on your heart. It might be helps in a church. It might be uh, teaching. It might be administrative. It might be healing team. It might be an elder. It might be a deacon. It might be evangelist. It might be one of the fivefold. Once you start to do this, you, this is what happens. Once you start to do the things, people in the body will start to notice and confirm what you're doing in the, in, in, that you have set into action. They'll come up to you and say, and they won't have to be prodded. They'll come up to say, you know what? You really do good in this area. I just noticed you'll have people confirm what God is already doing. That's the way prophetic works, words as well work. God will be speaking to you to do something, and then somebody, somebody will bring forth a prophetic word. That's how God does things. He'll confirm it. He'll confirm it. And people will walk, you know what, you know, that, you know, Sister Aubrey, you really do sing well. Hallelujah. You really do. Aubrey, you just sing wonderful. And, and Joy and Janice and Mark, you, think, you just sing good. Or, and, and Jim, you just do wonderful with, the, with ushering. And, 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 and Randy, you're such a good leader in, 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 in the board meetings. And, and, and it's, you'll start to see this. And Chuck, you're, not, you're so good out there sitting on the couch. We love you. Hallelujah. <laughs> I love you so much. He's the one most wonderful guy in the world to pick on. That's because I love you so much. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's what happens as you begin to understand a special calling. And then what happens as you begin to develop that, what, it goes from special, general special to a specific thing. And as, a spe, a, 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 as you develop this, God will give you a specific direction, okay, into the local body or the general body. And there will be a specific assignment for you to carry out. Let me just show you how this works, okay? I'll show you in my own life. I am... A believer therefore I have to do all the general things that God's Word says I am a believer how many believers do I have here today I supposed to do that I am called specifically to be a pastor teacher that is special now that took time for me to work through I went to school you don't have to go to school but it's nice to go to school there's nothing wrong with school but God can educate you any way he does so desires you're supposed to follow God and if that's to go to school, you go to school. If it's not, you just study to study, show yourself approved. That work in the, that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then you go into that, I am a pastor teacher. That's what I do. 
I love to be a pastor. I love, it's not even hard for me to be a pastor. It's not even hard for me to be a teacher. Matter of fact, you have to tell me to stop. Not right now, though. Amen. I, I, I have that special calling. And specifically, God has led me here to Gastonia, North Carolina, here at New Covenant, to you specifically. So I have that general, special, and specific call. That's the way it works. And some of you need to understand that because you've been waiting upon the, the things that God wants you to do and you have not stepped forth by faith. You need to act like it's so already. Now, the last part of that call might take time because, you know, God wants to specifically show you where to go, just like he did with the Apostle Paul. It wasn't, first of all, that he knew where to go to the Gentiles, but he started going out. He started being an evangelist. He started going out and starting churches. He did the work of the ministry and of, well, the work of the Apostle, and as he did it, he found out, and even Jerusalem acknowledged, hey, hey, it's pretty noticeable that you're supposed to go to the Gentiles, and it's pretty noticeable that Peter here, who already is in Jerusalem, he's good for the Jews. Y'all here today? How many know that you're good for something? Say, I'm good for something. Say it again, I'm good for something. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're good for something. Hallelujah. Now, once the stuff starts to operate, once this stuff starts to operate, then you can really get excited here. And it's already happening here at New Covenant and should be happening on the body of Christ general. People will get saved. People will get healed, delivered. There'll be spiritual growth that takes place, financial growth, numerical growth, ministerial growth. It just starts to happen. Why? Because you're taking your place. Say, I'm taking my place. Say it like you mean it. I'm taking my place. That's what it means. That doesn't mean you just take a place and make some space that you're in action with the Lord. You don't, don't occupy space. You're taking your place in ministry actively. Hallelujah. How many want to grow in the Lord? Let me see your hands. This is the way to do it. This is the way you do it. I don't care where you are in your journey now. This is the way you do it. Hallelujah. And what I want today to look at is two things before we proceed and close out this service today. I want you to discover that as we are called and to carry out the kingdom, there are two things I want to look at. What it looks like when we function as the called people of God in the church. And then number two, God wants us to work together. This one's a hard one. This is where I will really get off emotionally and have catharsis because that's what's happening in the body mostly. That we learn how to work together. How many believe the church should learn how to work together? Come on, turn to your neighbor and say yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. So what does it look like when we start to pursue and take our our calling seriously with God, and then find our place in the church. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, in the Living Bible concerning this subject. subject. You've heard me quote this before, but let me quote it to you again. And it says this, under Christ's direction, the whole body, and I put at New Covenant, is fit together. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere you're going. Wherever you are planted in the Lord, and God will show you. The whole body here is fit together perfectly, not imperfectly. How many know that God does perfect things? He uses imperfect people to accomplish perfect tasks. So he takes you who is imperfect, and then in each part, in its own special way, each part, in its own special way, helps. Helps. Everybody say helps the other parts. Helps doesn't hinder, helps, doesn't object, helps, doesn't obstruct, but helps, doesn't be a pain in the neck, but helps. I felt good saying that. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so that the whole body is healthy. Listen, healthy. Everybody say healthy. How many want to be in health? Hallelujah. It's wonderful to be in health. To keep your car in health, you have to maintain it. To keep your home intact, you have to maintain it. To keep your body healthy, you have to maintain it. To keep the church healthy, you have to maintain it. To keep that business flowing, you have to maintain it. It's a constant work. I was talking to Sylvia yesterday, and we were talking about how dirty the church gets. 
I says, isn't that wonderful? I says, you have a job because of that. Say amen. And that's what we do. We maintain. And maintaining the things of God in our life will give us health. I like that because in 3 John verse 2, he says, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prop. So if you want to remain in health, there's some body checkup that you need to do. There's some spiritual checkup that you need to do. There's some psychological check that you need to do. There's a sociological ch checking up that you need to do to remain in health. Is that okay with you? Hallelujah. And as you do that, so let me read it again. Under Christ's direction, the whole body here at New Covenant is fit together perfectly, and each part in its own special way helps the other parts so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. This is so neat. This is so wonderful. And what makes it so powerful is that as you begin to walk together in unity, what a powerful thing. I love my wife. We walk together in unity. We come together and pray. And we have a wonderful family, a wonderful house, because we walk together in unity. Unity is so imperative to have if you're going to walk successfully. You can't have disunity and walk in, in favor of God. You have to walk in unity with God and with your fellow brother and sister in the Lord. Now, I want to emphasize together how unity is. It, I'm talking about more than in a minute. We have to walk together all the time together. Say together. Hallelujah. That word together is unique. That occurs 62 times in the Greek New Testament here in the New Testament, and especially in the King James. And it means this. To be unified and integrated, it, it means included. We are not exclusive, we are inclusive. In other words, we want everybody to be a part. Regardless of your educational background, regardless of your color, regardless of your spiritual growth or where you are, we want to integrate. We want to come together. Man, I don't care if you're black, white, Puerto Rican, Italian, or whatever nationality. That's irrelevant. What's relevant is that you love God and working it out. Hallelujah. And that you come together. It means that we are on the same page, that we are together. It's like this. When you start hearing this in the church or in the family or with your brothers, hey, I got your back. Hey, this will work out. Yes, it is an issue. Yes, there is a, a thing here. I don't know about you, but I, I am pragmatic in my beliefs. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? As long as it's biblically correct, I want it to work out. As long as it's right, I want it to walk. And that means you have to walk together in unity. And one of the most powerful passages of Scripture is in Psalm 133 where, the, uh, where David wrote this psalm. Now listen to what it says. And he said, behold, how good. Mm -mm -mm. Now notice how he said that. He stopped. He said, behold, how good. This is good. And how pleasant. This is pleasant. How many of you have good and pleasant experiences in your walk with God? Man, some of you are wondering, what, when is it going to be good? When is it going to be pleasant? Here's how it goes. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren, sisters of well, sisterin, <laughs> to dwell together in unity. Unity is when we all come together in one purpose. Now, notice what he, he kind of identifies it with. It is like... Now, I, got, I had to look this one up because it didn't look too joyous to me. It was like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment. I didn't think that was too exciting when I thought about it. I remember one time I was in Guatemala, and we were commissioning a young man into the church as pastor. And they literally had a horn full of oil. And the guy had a nicer suit on than I did. And I'm standing there watching. I said, what are they going to do with that thing? And all of a sudden they came, they brought him up. We're talking about at least a quart of oil. Quart. Maybe more and poured it on his head. As I watched, it go, his head became, he was slicker than a 50 year old, a 50, 50s person in the old 50, 56 Chevy. And it went down and just started to saturate his, his suit and saturate his whole being. And 
All of a sudden I said, ew. <laughs> but I saw the results of something there. He went out in the spirit. And for two hours, everybody say two hours, he just laid there, almost spirit toast, not comatose, but spirit toast, <laughs> in the spirit. And he got up different. And what it's like here, when we see this, it's like that. It, it expresses a joyful experience. This is wonderful. This is good. This is pleasant. It's like that. We, matter of fact, we hear it in Psalm 23, verse 5, it says this. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Hallelujah. And you know what that means when it says my cup runs over? It's like when somebody's in your house and you want them to stay, in an old Hebraic way of saying to the person, you can stay in the house, they kept on filling the cup, filling the cup. And when they stop filling the cup, it's time to leave. And here's what he says, my cup runs over. It keeps on flowing. It's so good. It's so pleasant. This is what it's like. It's like the dew of Hermon, like the dew that descended upon the mountain of Zion. Now listen to what it says. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. The place of unity is the place of blessing. Say this, the place of unity is the place of blessing. That's when blessings start to flow. That's when, you ever go into a church where it's disunified? And they're all arguing on the color of the carpet? Or the color of the paint? Or whether so-and-so? Or whether we should have a white tissue or a purple one? God wants us to know something. It's the place of unity. We need to understand why we're here. The word unify or the unity thing is in the New Testament known as one accord. In the New Testament, it just calls it another thing. When we look at being unified in the New Testament, it comes under the heading of one accord. And that's not a Honda, although I like Honda. Say amen. Hallelujah. It's one accord. And when we function in one accord, the blessings of God begin to come. And I don't know about who you are, but that's also personally. When you are in unity with the Lord, you're in one accord with the Lord, and we need to come corporately in the same sense. That's when the blessings flow. When the blessings of God come, they come because you have unified yourself with the things of God and the people of God. Come on, say amen. That's good preaching. Hallelujah. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Listen to what it says. They were all together, all together with one Accord, with one accord, in one place. All together, one accord, one place. Now, I don't know about you, but when you get 120 people together in one room, and they're all together in one accord and one place, I don't call that anything but a miracle. How many know that God's still in the miracle business? Hallelujah! God is still in the unification of the body of Christ coming together so that this last day, I said this last day, that we will be a marching force against the kingdom of Satan. <laughs> Hallelujah. And as we begin to see this, we'll see how the Holy Spirit all of a sudden, all of a sudden, here's that word. It only occurs ten times in the Greek New Testament. Sudden. A sudden occurrence. Suddenly it came. It doesn't come suddenly, though. It came preparatory to the fact that they got together. They came together. And when they came together, suddenly it came. You didn't get that. When they came together, suddenly it came. If you want to get a suddenly Holy Ghost time in this church, you're going to have to come together. You're going to have to come together first with yourself, with God, and your call to general, special, and specific. And then you're going to have to come together with that person next to you who you might not like or you might like. And it doesn't matter to me whether you're black, you're white, Puerto Rican, or Italian, or any other nationality. It doesn't matter to me whether you're rich or poor or, or whatever state you're from in this union of the United States. It doesn't matter to God at all. All that matters to God is this, that you are born again and that you love Jesus with all your hearts. My God is here. My God is in control. My God can do all things, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come on, somebody say amen. Hallelujah. We need to understand this. As we do this, God begins to flow. 
You want to see the Spirit of God flow? Come together. You want to see just, if there's disunity, you end it. You say, no, no, we don't act that way. We don't talk that way. We don't speak that way. We walk the walk and talk the talk. Wow. We walk the walk. We talk the talk. We do the stuff. We are Christian else. We Christian. Hallelujah. The Bible uses the word ecclesia for the word church. I don't know, you might have heard that before, but it is actually a compound word, meaning two words come together in the Greek to form one, ekklesia, ek. If you look over here to my right, you see exit. The two letters in the front of it, ex, is the Greek word ek, or ex, and it means out of. That's why when you go to an exit, it's out of it. And you go to an entrance, in, which is the prefix in, and the Greek means in, you go into it. And that's where we got those words. We're either going out or we're coming in. And God wants you to know that we have been called out. The Bible says we are ecclesia. We are called out. Ek, out of what? Out of what? Into what? Out of what? Into what? Let's look at what God's wanting us to understand so we flow in the dynamic of the Holy Spirit. I, I'm going to take off my car. hot up here. Thank you, Jesus. God wants us to know something about this. You have been called. Say, I'm called. Say it like you mean it. I am called. Hallelujah. Let the devil know you know. You see, that's the problem with the church. That's the problem with the church. You're supposed to let the devil know that you know. See, he's trying to deceive you. Hallelujah. And that means this, you have been called out of what? The world. And you have called into what? The service of the kingdom. You are ecclesia. You are the called out ones. Hallelujah. And I want you to get this picture. If you can just kind of formulate this in your spiritual mind and your imagination. You're not only called out of the world into the service of God, but you are now a family. Huh? A family and an army at the same time. I don't know about you, but I love my personal biological family because I believe I have the best mother in the world for me. We went out looking for a car yesterday for her. She's 92 years old, and she wants a car. God bless her heart. But you know what the neatest thing was? How good and how pleasant it was to ride around with my 92-year-old mom together some of you wish you can say that right now some of you who have parents that have gone on man you'd give anything and I cherish those moments hallelujah matter of fact we went out to uh, Cheddar's and she likes chicken wings and she said John when I die please put a six pack of chicken wings in my casket <laughs> If I do, Mom, I'm going to eat them. Hallelujah. <laughs> I want you to get this picture, though. We are a family, and we are an army. How many appreciate their family? Man, family is so important. Did you ever, how many ever argued with a sibling or a parent? Come on, raise your hand. Let me see that. Next, some of you might be lying here. How many ever got mad? at their parent or mad at their sister. Let me see your hands. Some of you are like this. <laughs> That's called, you are a weenie. <laughs> I, I, I get mad at my, I really seldom do, you know, but I have such a wonderful family, but I've been mad before, and they've been mad at me. But guess what? I've been mad at Janice before. She's been mad at me. I've been mad at my kids before, and they've been mad at me. I've been happy with my kids before. They've been happy with me. It doesn't matter. I said it doesn't matter. I said it doesn't matter. I said it doesn't matter. What matters is we're a family. And if we can do that for the family biological, we can do it for the, for the family spiritual. And matter of fact, it's important, this family that we have now 
in the spirit is so unique that it extends from earth to heaven right now. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, it says this. For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. I want you to look up right now beyond the ceiling and just wave and say hello, guys, up there. Say hello to mama, hello to papa, hello to sister, hello to brother, hey, aunt and uncle. Hey, guys. Hello. There's a family. There's a cloud of witnesses. There's a cloud, and it's a family, and I can't get out of that. It's a forever family. How many are, and if you're not a part of that family today, I want to welcome you, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. I want to welcome you to the forever family, a family that will not die, and a family that will be extended from earth. You might as well learn how to get along with each other down here, or you're going to have to go to class 101, 102, 104 up in heaven. <laughs> Everybody say amen. <laughs> and not only that, we're an army. I love this. That, I, that uh, exemplifies a, a, a strategic maneuver, a militant force in the spirit realm. And I love this because in 2, Corinthians, 2 Timothy 2, 30, it calls us good soldiers of Jesus Christ. <laughs> good soldiers. Good soldiers. Not bad. You're good. Say I'm a good soldier right now in Jesus' name. And I want you to see something. As good soldiers... You don't have to be afraid of the enemy. You know why? He's already defeated. He has no feet. He's already disarmed. He has no arms. And when you see Satan, actually the original, the origination, the etymology of that word means that's the one. And then when we eventually get into heaven and we see Satan cast into the bottomless pit, can you say glory to God? We'll say that's the one. That's the one that caused all the trouble. That's the one, and we as a militant army don't need to be afraid because we have already had the success of Jesus Christ behind us. We have the authority of God, and all we have to do is fight the good fight of faith. We don't have to fight the devil. We don't have to fight the sickness. We don't have to fight the situation. We don't have to fight the things around us. Jesus Christ is more than a con has made us more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? We need to stay in faith and look to the word. The good fight of faith is this. I don't want to get my eyes off the word because when I do, I start to sink. I'm going to keep my eyes on the word of God. Hallelujah. We are in the army. So we're called. This is what it's supposed to look like. Victorious. And there's everything there. There's the calling. There's the anointing. There's the service of God. Nothing can stop us except one thing. Here's where the problem comes in the church. There's only one thing that can stop us. You all know what that is? Ourselves. And that's why for the last part of this sermon, I'm going to hit you straight in the face with this stuff. But you'll love it. And you'll need to hear it. Because it's the biggest problem that we have with ourselves and the church. The second part is God wants us to work together. Did you know I had this service? Some of you might be thinking I had strategically done this service for today by way of circumstances that were happening. Nope. This was planned back in November of 13. God knew where we would be Labor Day. <laughs> it's time to work together day in Jesus' name. How, this is prophetically coming forth. Here's what we need to understand. Now listen. Here's what you and I need to understand as well. No two people are exactly alike. And anytime people are called upon to work together in a corporate effort, in a corporate setting, it's necessary to discipline ourselves so that our other person's little idiosyncrasies, their quirks, their personalities, their preferences do not abstract us from the common goal we have as a church. I mean to say this, people don't leave churches, they leave people because they don't know how to get along with people. And if you want to grow, you need to learn how to get along with people. And if you don't like to get along with people, then you'll never grow. You'll never go any farther than where you are because God will only use people who know how to get along with people. I had amens more on this side. I don't know what happened over here. Hallelujah. Now, we are here for Christ. How many believe that? 
to reach people for Christ. How many believe that? To grow in Christ. How many believe that? And to work together as one in Christ. How many believe that? That's our goal. That's our mission. That's our objective. Keep your eyes on the goal. Keep your eyes on the objective. My goal as a pastor is to oversee. What that means is I oversee the situations and make sure that we are in line with this purpose. That we are going forth in the name of Jesus and on goals of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. This is not my church. This is our church, his church as one. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy to do this. God knows. Listen, I'm not, I use myself. I have bad issues. How many know that I have issues? I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be funny. I do. You know, I'm from a different culture background, and I can say things wrong, don't mean it, and it can hurt somebody, and vice versa. Or I can say, and, I, and it might be a wrong time of the day, and I say something wrong. Or it might be a situation that I, we just didn't work out that day, and we just, because when you get people together, what happens is problems arise. And the way you become a successful person is you become a problem solver. You become a problem solver. We are a body of believers, and it's together we work to help this church become fun. Any church. If you're just checking us out, that's fine. Any church you go to. You have to get in. You have to work together. You have to go through a lot of issues. I'll never forget. And then you probably heard me say it. When we put together our board seriously in 06, for the first year, we argued and complained, not in a bad way, but we fought. And, but you know what we had? We had a unifying effect. We're going to stay together, and we're going to work this out. And because we did so, our church within the next year went debt-free. <laughs> debt-free. We took 400 and some thousand dollars that we couldn't pay, and with one, one check, paid it off to the glory of God. We came to the next part of our building, which was 600 and some thousand dollars, and paid that off in the same way. We are a debt-free church, not because of us, but because of the unifying effect that the body of Christ has, that we work together as one. And if you want the blessings of God to flow, you better get in unity yourself. And I'm not bragging on myself. I'm bragging on the word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, this is good. Hallelujah. Listen, many of us, uh, the best things in life come together because we're, we have to teamwork it. We have to work together. And let me just say this. This is powerful. When you and I recognize the contributions that you and others make together, this is a sign, listen to me, of spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity is seen when you see others and their efforts as contributive to the solidarity of us as one. That is a sign of spiritual maturity because that says, you know, I need you, you need me. I know my gifts, you know your gifts. We come together and make it. That's called covenant. We share our strengths and we come together as one. Listen, we are not only workers in the Lord, we are fellow workers. We are not only to operate, we are to cooperate together. We have to come to mind and say, you know what? I'm just going to do what the Lord says. I'm going to step in. I'm going to go forth. How many want to see the kingdom of God grow? Come on. This church will grow, but I'm not here about this church. I'm here about the kingdom. And God will build the church. You build the kingdom, and God will build your church. That's a word. You build the kingdom. That means whether they go to New Covenant or, or Bethlehem Baptist or uh, Elevation or this or that church. Let me just say something. You start planting seed and God will reward you. Man, that's a powerful statement for a pastor to make because all the pastors want their thing to grow. What I want to grow is the kingdom of God. I'm in service to the king. And when you see that and you start practicing that, it can't help but have a ripple effect within the church because we'll be unified. You'll be a unified body that says, you know what? I'm not out for self. I'm out for Jesus. Come on, shout amen. This is good. 
This is better than good. This is the kingdom of God. This is kingdom work. This is the anointing of God. This is the power of God that's going to send you forth to the other side. This is what's going to take you over to become another person. This is what it takes to become godly. This is what it takes to become what man of God you are or woman of God you are. Man, I feel the anointing up here. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If I fall out in the spirit, somebody just leave me there because I just feel so good here. I just want to stay in the presence of the Lord. I want to stay. Whoa! Here it comes. Come on them, Lord. Come on them right now. Come on them right now. The anointing of God. The flow of the Holy Spirit. Huh. See how it works? See how it works? How good and how pleasant it is. How good. When we catch this vision and look beyond ourselves to what God has called us to do, there is no doubt that God will lead us to even greater, greater works than him. Greater works shall you do. Greater works together. Hallelujah. Come on up, guys. Thank you, Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 says, If God be what? For us, who can be against us? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Man, I, if I ever felt like I preached today, I felt like I preached today. Hallelujah. Huh. As Christians, there's work to be done. So make a decision today. Go forward. Don't look at the complainers. You see a complainer in the church, say, listen, I love you. We're going forth. I got your back. We're going to make this work. We're going to go forth. You ever see around, let me just say this, you ever see people that just stay in that negative flow? Ah, she said, this is so long, this is too much, I don't know if I like it. You know what that does? That's destructive, not constructive. Nobody's perfect but Jesus, and he'll help us become better. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed.